down in Arkin, down in Arkin, down in Arkansas. They don't need a traffic cop. Well, there's just two stores in the blacksmith shop. The trains go by, but they never stop. Down in Arkansas. Life Boy presents the Bob Burns Show, bringing you latest news of those kinfolks in Van Buren. More doings of the Arkansas Traveler. Mike Jones and his city slickers. And now, uh, just a minute, boys. Now, I want to introduce Dick Lane, who will in turn introduce our most important guest for this evening. Okay, Dick. Ladies and gentlemen, never in my long experience in the show business did I ever dream that I would one day be granted the high privilege and signal honor of introducing so much of a man to so many people. I have but to mention his name, and you recognize him as not only one of the finest musicians, but one of the most renowned actors of radio, stage, and screen. April Fool, it's only Bob Burns! Well, that was uh, that was Dick Lane carrying on just like like that then. <laughs> Ain't he cute? He's only forty something. <laughs> Dick, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, a grown man of your age. I am playing, not. Oh, playing these April Fool pranks. Hey, don't it get discouraging, honestly, to see <laughs> these grown men and grown people year after year carry on those boyhood pranks like they did on April Fool? I, I don't want to be an old cross patch or anything, but I, it's just kind of an obsession with me. <laughs> That's the reason why on April Fool I never pay any attention to anybody. I just, I just don't, don't listen to anything anybody says. Not today, today. Uh, somebody called up on the telephone, and it was a girl's voice, and she wanted to know if I could have lunch with her today at twelve o'clock sharp at the Brown Derby. And I says, "Who is it?" And she says, "It's Hetty Lamar." Well, now I knew it was just an April Fool prank, so I only waited four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Bob, that, that new secret weapon that they call a uh, bazooka, that isn't any April Fool's joke, and that must make you feel awful proud, huh? Yeah, Dick, that sure does make me feel proud. Well, I should think it would. Some of the higher-ups seem to think that that bazooka might win the war. Well, that wouldn't surprise me none. I always did say my old bazooka won the last war. Well, uh, I know you took it to France with you, but what makes you think it won the war? Well, now, Dick, now listen here. Now, man to man, what would you think? Well... Now, I, I took it over there, and I played it before all the soldiers, all the American soldiers, and the French soldiers, all the Allies, and I, suddenly it dawned on me one day that there was only one bunch of soldiers in the war that hadn't heard my bazooka. So on the... I'll never forget, on the night of November 10th, I crawled out there, it was a dark night, and I crawled out in no man's land, halfway between the two armies, and I sat in a shell hole, and I turned my bazooka toward the German army, and for four solid hours, I played that bazooka at them Germans. So that was the night of the 10th of November? The 10th of November. The next day, November 11th, the armistice was signed. <laughs> yeah. You know, they say... <laughs> The thing that makes me proud is, uh, is just the fact that somebody would take the old bazooka and perfect it, you know, and work on it. Now, I notice that, it, I guess you notice, if you've seen me play it, that, that I always, when I turn the bazooka toward an audience and play it, I always keep both eyes shut. That, that's because I just can't stand to see people suffer. <laughs> And I've often wondered if that thing could ever be perfected so that it would it would make people suffer more. <laughs> and I, when they come out with this new war instrument, this secret weapon called a bazooka, I thought at first, well, that's it. But but then on second thought, that instrument is more humane than my old bazooka because that thing kills people immediately. <laughs> Mine just sort of numbs them. <laughs> And, uh, well, sir, now, now I just, uh, these people claim that this new instrument, when they turn it on something that, and turn it loose, that everything disappears. Well, ain't nothing new about that. My old bazooka has been doing that to audiences for years. <laughs> I'm going to come back after a while and play it for you, just to show you what I mean. I just, uh, I'm kind of reminiscent tonight, but... Anyhow, uh, I just can't forget that the condition that music was in when I first come back from France, the last war. The, the number that was sweeping the country then was a piece called The Vamp. 
Now, the vamp in 1919, she was a girl that sort of corresponds to our oomph girl of today. Now, if Spike Jones don't bring back memories of them days with the vamp, at least he can make you forget your troubles today. Del Porter's going to sing it. Go ahead, boy. <laughs> Good knee. Vamp all night and day. Keep vamp until you vamp your cares away. music, Spike. I declare that boy can make music on pretty near anything. You give that boy three tin cans, an old rubber boot, and he'll get medals and spring song out. No, Bob, what's Spike Jones got that I haven't got? Well, now, that'll take you quite a while to answer that, Dick, but for one thing, Spike's got a pappy in the Army. Spike's pappy's in the Army? Mm -hmm. Well, one good thing about that, now he'll have to wash every day. Oh, I I don't know that he will, Dick. Of course he will. Chances are he'll use Life Boy soap because Life Boy is the most popular soap in the armed forces. And no wonder. A Life Boy bath peps you up, makes you feel fine after a long, hard day's drill. Yeah, but Dick, I've been trying to tell you Spike's pappy ain't in the army you're thinking of. Oh, I know, I know. You mean he's in the army of war workers. Well, Life Boy's the favorite with them, too. Yeah, but you don't understand. Of course I understand. It's so important to keep those tanks and planes rolling off the assembly lines that not a minute can be spared, even for sickness, if it can be prevented. So, wise, patriotic war workers help protect themselves against germs by washing their hands with Life Boy regularly. Yeah, but not Spike Pet. Why? Doesn't he think he needs Life Boy? Oh, sure, but he's just kind of ornery. Besides, he don't like to watch because it always gets his beard wet. His beard? Mm -hmm. What army did Spike Pappy join? The Confederate Army, Dick. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Oh. <laughs> There have been some odd customers calling on the traveler in his office of the paper, he edits. So let's see who it is this time. But this is preposterous, sir. You refuse to print my advertisement? I sure do. My card, sir. Colonel Britton T. Farnsworth. And if you doubt the color of my money, gaze upon this. You've seen greenbacks, I presume. Oh, yes. Once in a while, I run into one of them Morgan phone mash notes. But it's not the color of your money, I doubt, Colonel. It's the color of that medicine you sell. Oh, a doubting Thomas, then. Twenty-seven years I've traveled this land with my entertainment unit, vulgarly called a medicine show, acquainting an ailing world with the virtues of the no pain gold, the sovereign remedy of the Choctaw Indian tribe. Twenty-seven years and never about a return. 
Taken internally, your rub on. The results are equal for sunburn, corns, rheumatism, indigestion. Come, come. What harm can there be in announcing that I appear daily to diagnose free the ailments of those who suffer? Colonel, I learned a trick one time. I kind of like to show off among my friends. Now, I got here three walnut shells and an ordinary little pea. Now, when I move the shells, guess which one the pea's on? Oh, I say, old man, did you ever travel in uh, the sovereign remedy line yourself? Go on now, which shell's it under? Really, sir, you work that ancient trick most clumsily. It's under that one, of course. Well, I'll be darned. You guessed right. That means you lose, Colonel. Uh I lose? Yeah, it means I won't run any ads for your medicine. But I demand a reason. Well, now there's four reasons. First, your medicine show it don't mean a thing to this community. Second, paper's got to be saved. And third, we need space for legitimate ads. Hmm. What's the fourth reason? Oh, the fourth reason. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I don't like your face. Good you... day, Colonel. <laughs> this is preposterous. No, this is where you come in. Yeah, do you want to see me? Yeah, sure. This is an outrage. I shall go go place my business somewhere else. Look, Traveler, I just caught this proof sheet. It says Butch O'Hara's a tire thief. That's libel or slander or something. Hmm, let me see it. Well, what's wrong? The story quotes the patrol officer Pritchard is saying he caught Butch O'Hara red-handed, taking the tire off a roaster at six and now. Yeah, I, I don't care. You can't print it. Butch O'Hara didn't steal a tire. Oh, you know this, Butch. Is that it? Sure I know him. That is, he goes to my school. Yeah, but, Joey, we can't suppress news just because a friend's involved. I tell you, it's libel or whatever you call it. It says here, Joey, that Butch has a bad record. He's caused the school a lot of trouble, and he's been picked up twice for minor violations. Well, he's liable to be Judge Butch past, Joey. I know Butch is tough, but he wouldn't steal a tire. He couldn't. Got any evidence, or is that just a hunch? Both. That knife I had with the four blades and the bone handle, mm -hmm. there wasn't a kid in school wouldn't have given his front teeth for it. Well, I lost it, see? And who do you suppose found it and gave it back? Butch O'Hara. Now I ask you, would a guy like that steal tires? It does sound kind of out of character. Please, Traveler, they got Butch up at Central Jail. Can't we see him and maybe figure out what happened before this has got to be printed? All right, do it, if you insist. I'll get Chief Police Nelson's okay, then you and me are going to go and see Butch. Yeah, sure, you can see the boy, Traveler. But what can anybody do? He had the tire off the car and in his hands when Officer Pritchard caught him. Uh, what's his story, Chief? Well, he claims a man who said he owned the car gave him a dollar to take the tire off the wheel and go to the Chevney garage to be fixed. But the car owner denies that, and the tire hasn't a thing wrong with it. It don't sound so good. Well, if you don't want to go on from there, tell us more about the man he says paid him or the Chevney garage, but he won't. I gave him every break, questioned him myself as nice as I could. But he's picked up some tough ways, talks out of the corner of his mouth, says the dumb cops can find out the rest for themselves. What can I do? You know, there's been too much of this lately, Nelson, especially boys stealing cars. Yeah, you're telling me. A juvenile problem has the police in every city worried plenty. Parents off fighting or working, too few playground supervisors, youth leaders, and so on left to care for the boys. Is that what's wrong with Butch? He's typical. His dad's in the Marines, his mother's on the swing ship at the Kravney plant, their home's an apartment on Epstein. What kind of a woman is his mother? She's a fine woman. She'd straighten her boy out if she had the time. Naturally, she's been pleading for a boy, saying that Butch isn't there. She may be right. I don't know, no know as I ever saw a really bad boy, at least not at 13. Well, they're coming younger every year, Traveler. But you talk to him. I hope you can get something out of him. If he'll only give us a straight story of what he was up to, we might know a lot more about this wave of tire stealing lately and who's been disposing of Butch. Hi. I brought a guy to see him, my boss on the paper. Butch O'Hara, the traveler. Traveler, this is Butch O'Hara. Hi, son. Okay, what do you have? A story with or without the sobs? Well, can't a fella come to see you without wanting something? Dewey here says you're innocent. I don't want to have to print anything that might harm you for the rest of your life, Butch. I told my story about 20 times to that dumb chief. Ask him. No, well, don't be like that, Butch. The traveler's okay. He's a real guy. I said I'd told my story. The guy said the car was his. Gave me a buck to take off the tire into the Chevney garage. 
While I was doing it, the cops came up and started trouble. That's all I know. What kind of a guy, Butch? How do I know? He was dressed all right. Talked like he might own a car like that. Had a lot of dough in his pocket. Any idea how much money? I couldn't tell. He just peeled a dollar he gave me off a roll of a choke a horse. He gave no name? Why should he? He never asked mine. Well, how old a man was he? Oh, older than you, kind of, I guess. I don't know. Well, now, would you know him if you saw him again? I sure wish I could get the chance. All right, Butch. I'm going to ask Chief Nelson to let you look over the file of photographs at the fingerprints of yours. It'll take patience, thousands of them, but you might come across the man who gave you that dollar. Oh, it's no use, mister. You didn't find one picture that looked like the man, huh? Well, here are three tentatively picked out, traveler. Oh, I ain't really sure of those either. After about the millionth, they all began looking the same. We can eliminate the first two pictures. The men are both in the penitentiary. And third, well, the man could have changed a lot in the 12 years since this was taken. I picked that third one because the eyes are kind of like the man's I talked to. Uh, here's his police record, Charlie. Let's see. Horace Watson, alias Sergeant Johns, alias Captain Folsom, alias Major Humphrey. Well, he kind of promoted himself every once in a while, didn't he? <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's a con artist and a shell game man. Last heard of, he was running a cheap medicine show. Medicine show? Holy smoke. Butch. Yes, sir? That man, uh, did he wear a white vest and talk big, you know, uh, pompously with a lot of flourish? Yeah. Yeah, that's him exactly. You'd have thought he was setting me up for life with that dollar. Chief, Butch's eyes are pretty keen at that. This picture may be old, but this man's in town. I think I know just where he is. Yes, indeed, no pain co a sovereign remedy. Secret with the top coined in crime until revealed to yours truly, Colonel Britton T. Farnsworth. Well, 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 if it isn't the esteemed editor of the local paper. Try a bottle, sir. No, no, me and my friend, we're just looking around your place. Uh, where's your crowd, Colonel? Business seems slow. Oh, they come and they go. That's life. You haven't been using this medicine racket to cover a new line, have you, Colonel? I don't think I understand, sir. Anything to do with a stolen tire racket? If you infer I'd be in anything but legitimate trade, sir, you're badly mistaken. What do you know about the Chevney Garage, Colonel? Chevney Garage? I never heard of it in my life. And I don't see the reason for these questions. If you want a bottle of no pain, co say so. Otherwise, I'll I'll take a bottle, Colonel. Oh, the esteemed editor takes one. Here you are, sir. All right. One dollar. Change of five? Of course, of course. <clears throat> there you are. Thanks. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Something wrong? You've got a lot of nerve trying to pass off a counterfeit a dollar like this on me. I saw nothing wrong with him. Then look again. You're slipping, Colonel. Oh, so counterfeit money, too, huh? Let's see the rest of that roll, Colonel. Certainly, certainly. I got nothing to hide. Mm-hmm. Quite a roll, too. Horace Watson, alias Farnsworth. Now, don't tell us you got those from the customer. Careful how you answer that. This man is the chief of police. I get it. Trying to pin a counterfeit rap on me. Well, you don't get away with it. Those bills were given me. I'm not taking a federal rap for nobody. That double-crossing Ormsby gave them to me. Ormsby? At the Chevney Garage? Yes, that land. land. Huh? Then you are in a stolen tire rack. I'm no such thing. I just got in a few tires for Ormsby, that's all. I could name a dozen who brought in a lot more than I did. Your method was to find a likely kid, pay him a dollar to remove a tire, then you collect it from Ormsby, right? Okay, okay, you got it figured out. An old hand of my experience, getting paid off in queer money. Well, if I go up for this, I'm sure taking Ormsby with me. I'll prove he bought a hundred tires the past month, hot as a two-dollar pistol. Well, Nelson, how about Butch's story? He was telling the truth, all right. Colonel, come on down to the station. You'll have your chance to fix your pal Ormsby. Come on. Come on, kill the Empire. Battle up. Come on, right over the place. All right, all right, Joey. I told you to practice your baseball outside, Mahomes. Oh, gee, I forgot, boss. But Butch O'Hara, he's organized a new team, and he's letting me be catcher. That's for solving his case, you might say. Well, that's kind of decent to Butch. You understand, he's pretty much the town's model citizen these days. Yeah, and he and his gang have been doing just like you told them to. They sold a thousand pounds of scrap yesterday. Say, I just read about that colonel in Ormsby getting sentenced. 
But I didn't see a thing about counterfeit money. Well, Dory, the colonel's money wasn't counterfeit at all. But you said it. Oh, I said no such thing. I just hinted it might be, and he talked himself into thinking it was. That's what being too smart and having a guilty conscience will do for a man, Dory. Before Bob returns to tell you about his relatives, Spike Jones is going to help me tell you about a lovely young girl who was all dressed up on a beautiful spring day. Ah, but she was very, very sad because nobody loved her. And the reason was... Right. Then this lovely young girl started using Life Boy. And everything turned out fine. She got all dressed up and met a handsome sailor boy on a lovely spring day. And do you know what finally happened? Now, that girl was lucky because she woke up to Life Boy. But so many of us forget that we, too, perspire, and we have to beware of B.O., especially in the spring and summer. It's worth your while to take a Life Boy bath or shower every day. For Life Boy in that daily bath really stops B.O. fast. Well, as fast as a sailor stops a pretty young girl all dressed up on a beautiful Sunday morning in spring. Mike, let's hear you and the boys tell the whole story yourself. <laughs> So far, so good. And then, Life Boy to the rescue. again, Bob Burns. Here's Bob Burns. Well, thank you. You know, I told you a while ago, I, I said I was going to play my bazooka before you tonight, but uh, I just can't, uh, I just can't get started without telling you what I've been thinking over there. Ever since we did that little play with that little boy where he was misjudged, you know, everybody thought he was a bad boy. That took me back to the time when I was a boy, when I first invented the bazooka. Everybody in Van Buren thought that I was just wasting my time. And they thought I was a bad boy, especially in school. And I'll never forget this day. We were working on, uh, uh, well, it wasn't arithmetic either. It was, I didn't take arithmetic. It was, uh, uh, Oh, it was, it was grammar, that's what I know, because I didn't have no time for nothing but grammar. <laughs> and, and I remember that the teacher come around to me, and she says, why ain't you writing in your copybook? And I says, I ain't got no pencil. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she says, I haven't a pencil. You haven't a pencil. She hasn't a pencil. He hasn't a pencil. I said, well, I might as well go home. Ain't nobody got no pencil. <laughs> and I, you see, I wasn't, I wasn't a bad boy at all in school. And, and I did, let's see, I did, take, I did take one other study in that I remember. That's spelling. I'll never forget that. Now, this, uh, this, uh, I remember the time the teacher asked me to spell weather. Now, I can spell it now, but... But then it was a little... We, we had in school back home, we had what they call the progressive form of spelling. You know, where you spell a syllable and you pronounce it, and then you spell the next syllable and pronounce that, and you carry the word right on? So I got up and I said, weather. W-E, where, there you got your where. E-T-H, S, there you got your S, there you got your where, S. H-U-R, her, there you got your F, her, there you got your where, S, her. <laughs> yes. 
This teacher looked at me a long time. And finally she says, well, I've been teaching school here for 40 years. And that's the worst spell of weather we ever had. <laughs> but, now, you see, that teacher was wrong there to discourage me like that at that tender age. I was only 17. <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, that, that children should be encouraged. And that's the reason why to this day, when I see a boy trying to better himself, I always try to help him as much as I can. That's now like my cousin Luther Roundtree. Now, today he went down to take an intelligence test, and I've been helping him. Luther, come up here. I've been, I've been helping him with his examination. That Luther, you was late getting to the show today, and I didn't have a chance to find out how you come out on that intelligence test. Well, the reason I was late, because I didn't have no gas for my car, and I had to ride my mule in. Oh, you had to ride your mule, huh? Well, how did you come out on the test? Well, after I took the intelligence test, the mule rode me home. <laughs> well, I can't understand that, Luther. I gave you all the answers to the questions that told you what to say. Well, that's just the trouble. What do you mean? Well, you know that question, why did the early pilgrims go into the wilderness? Yeah. Well, the neck was the wrong answer. <laughs> Well, don't you feel bad. Don't you feel bad, Luther. You know that little song that says, April showers bring May flowers. See, that's the cue for my bazooka solo. Let's get going. <laughs> I guess it looks to me like that just about winds up our little show tonight. But before you go, I do want to tell you that I've got some inside dope on this war situation. Now, don't you folks get discouraged at uh, those German reports that they've been sending over the air about their small casualty list. They forgot to mention all them soldiers who was lost straight or Stalin. Thank you very much. <laughs> The makers of Life Boy will again bring you Bob Burns next week at the same time with more about his relatives, more doings of the Arkansas Traveler, and Spike Jones and his city slickers. Remember, Life Boy is the only soap especially made to stop... Today, no American can afford to be tired, nervous, low in vitamins. Yet, with food rationing and shortages, it's harder to get vitamin-rich foods. So, take Vim. VIMS give you all the vitamins government experts say are essential. And the balanced formula doctors endorse. And in addition, VIMS supply all the minerals commonly lacking. Get VIMS at your druggist. VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals. Get that VIMS feeling. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>